Um, thanks so much uh, for coming to this greeting. It's Alessandra and Kim. It's a complete pleasure again to introduce them. And we'll have a little chat afterwards as well. Um, actually, the two... The two, I was going to say the two lads, you can tell them before, um, two uh, have very similar title collections. Um, one, one is an earlier collection of, of Sanders, which is Theories of Falling, and Kim's going to read from um, The Art of Falling. Um, and uh, Sanders going to read first, so I'll tell you a little bit about them, and then they're going to read for about 20 minutes. So Sandra was born, I didn't know this existed until a few days ago, Vienna, Virginia, <laughs> yes. and now she lives in D.C. Um, so this particular question was singled out um, for the new issues poetry prize, which is judged by Mary Howe. And um, both of these authors are really grappling with kind of um, managing the unmanageable, sort of controlling things that are out of our control. And sort of each, I don't know, each poem is almost like its own little blueprint. Um, if you think of something like managing the art of falling or um, periods of falling, it doesn't seem like things that we can control. Um, and Sandra's beautiful collection called Counting the Waves. Um, there's a lot of sort of uh, resonances with other, with, with in dialogue with other authors. So, um, it's a beautiful line that Emily built a prism of her skirts and take it with Emily Dickinson. <laughs> um, and um, Rickman once made a hospital um, his home. That's from the title of the poem. Um, and also, Kim refers to Virginia Woolf uh, making a room of one's own in her art of falling. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Kim as well. Um, she was born in Leicester and she lives in Cumbria now. She's won many awards, as well as Sandra. And she's won the Eric Gregory and the Jeffrey Dermer. Mm. I nearly always called it Jeffrey Dermer. <laughs> Dermer. <laughs> and sorry, sorry, just my background. And um, I actually had the pleasure of taking one of the Kim's classes a few years ago. Um, what work is? And um, after the Philip Levine poem. And um, both of these authors are so skilled at kind of stepping into their shadows and stepping into the shadows of other people. And um, when I, I write um, micro part time, and people say that's not work, that's not work, you know. And I think both of these authors um, show the beauty and, and ugliness um, of what it is to be a poet. Um, so I'm going to stop talking and let them take the floor. So thank you. The number of thank yous I would need to say for an opportunity like this is kind of unfathomable because I'm not just here for the festival, I'm here for uh, three months. And I'm so grateful to the Munster Literature Center for giving me this opportunity to be the John Montague Fellow and for the University of Cork uh, University College Court community that's welcomed me, all the friends, uh, new friends in the room uh, that I can't see right now because the lights are quite bright, but fortunately I know you're out there. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I, won't, uh, I won't spend my time on that other than just to say that this is a profoundly um, life-changing opportunity, and I'm so grateful to be in Ireland for the first time. I'm going to read uh, a couple of poems from Theories of Falling, which I hardly ever do these days, but it was mentioned and uh, a student of mine who's in the room said he thought people might respond to these poems, which are, they're my heart poems. They're the poems that, as is so often the case with the first book, uh, are drawn from deeply from the well of family, uh, those complicated dynamics that shape who we are. This poem is called Holiday. The tree is a spruce monster, refusing to fit, so my father decapitates it with a handsaw. We drape the body with tinsel before he weaves in bulbs their white and steady light and sneaks in his blinker bulbs of blue and green. This year, there are strikes. 
My sister refuses to open her advent calendar until my father sees a doctor. My father refuses to see the doctor, popping Excedrin. My mother votes we go on a cruise or to her sister's house, anywhere she won't have to hang ornaments. We thumb through her maps and clippings, but it's that familiar silver that fills our palms. Tinsel will be picking from the carpet until May. On the eve, we open one gift, make one toast, feast, curried vegetables, green beans and bacon, wine and more wine, always a knife sharp enough to cut the roast of our hearts. A lover said, I've never seen people trying so hard to make each other happy manage to make each other so miserable. <laughs> Clearly, I said, you do not understand the true meaning of Christmas. <laughs> Tonight, we'll wrap gifts until dawn, alone in our many rooms, the house quiet except for my father's cough, except for 25 Advent chocolates rattling behind 25 unopened windows, except for my sister stringing up her angel ornaments, in one hand their tiny napes of neck, and in the other, a hook. <laughs> one of my first experiences uh, within the larger UK poetry community was the very odd thing I was plagiarized. Uh, Christian Ward, who was a somewhat infamous plagiarist for a time, took a poem of mine called August, and I ended up writing about this because August is a poem so intimate to me and to this book. This book was primarily written in September, and August was the psychic state that delivered me to being ready to write these poems. And he took the book and he, uh, he took the poem and he just switched the gender, and he turned a reference to gasoline to petrol jelly, and he kind of did all of these surface substitutions to make it quote unquote his poem, and it was really evidently mine. <laughs> I took it back. August. Sooner or later, the thing you value most will beg to be burned. Trust me, says the phoenix, I'm immortal. Watch your childhood home, how the wires fray, how the baseboards splinter to tinder. Your nights are split open by steam and the writhing of hoses. Your sister learns to thicken ja gasoline with jelly, collects canisters. The man you love shares a mouthful of smoke with someone else. Trust me. Even Joan of Arc, when age 10, tanned her arms as she tended the sheep. I'm immortal. Tomorrow will rise to a full boil, but still you'll strip down, lay out, you'll slick the thin tanning oil over your chest. For six nights before the city blazed, Nero could not sleep, pacing the palace balcony. He fiddled to ease his nerves. A pretty tune, whispered Rome, lips licked with flame, mouth readying to sing. <coughs> After publishing Theories of Falling and after uh, being under contract to write a memoir, uh, which is called Don't Kill the Birthday Girl, Tales from an Allergic Life, um, I was really ready to write away from the self. And so in the collection I was the jukebox, there's poems that occupy unconventional voices, poem in the voice of a piano, uh, in an orchid, poem of a world war, um, and this one which opens, which is in the voice of sand. I was interested in the idea of writing something that was in a voice that was multiplicative. And my dad uh, used to riddle me um, about sand. That it's, when somebody asks you what sand is, you might think of shell or granite, small stone. But sand is a size. Anything can be sand. The sand speaks. I'm fluid and omnivorous. The casual kiss. I'll knock up your oysters, I'll eat your diamonds. I'm a mutt, no one thing at all, just the size that counts. And if your animal small enough, come. If your vegetable small enough, come. If your mineral small enough, come. Mothers, brush me from the hands of your children. Lovers, shake me from the cuffs of your pants. Draw a line, make it my mouth. I'll name your country. 
I'm a yes man at heart. Let's play hide and go drown. Let's play pearls for his eyes. When the men fall, I like the way their arms touch, their legs touch. There are always more men, men who bring bags big enough to hold each other. A man who kneels down with a smaller bag, cups and pours, cups and pours, as if I could prove anything. When Pat was talking about our time in Cyprus, uh, he, he mentioned a wonderful prompt, which was to write poems in response to these museum pieces. We also had a kind of peculiar prompt where we had submitted poems. We didn't know how they'd be used, and it turned out that they were used in the form of this dramatic performance, where basically they had taken 20 poems of ours and cut them up into pieces and stitched them together to create this kind of external narrative played out quite dramatically by two people we'd never met until that conference. And we didn't know where our poems were going to appear or which lines, and they had us seated on stage in a semicircle in back of this dramatic performance as it was going on. And so you were hearing, listening for your poem in real time with no idea, and trying to maintain an audience space that would not just completely distract and bewilder those looking on. The poem I contributed for that was a poem called The Minotaur Speaks. And uh, since I didn't get to really hear it in its entirety then, I'll, I'll read it now. The Minotaur Speaks. The queen lay in the hollow of a wooden cow, so my father would mount her, his white hide glistening like a raw moon. To love is to look up up, up. She named me Asterius, the starry one. When the king heard my birth cry, he raised black curtains to every window in Crete. He began to build. My father was led away by a rope around his neck. My mother gave me the apple of her breast, and I bit it off. To love is to feed and feed again. My room has 32 walls, no mirror, no chair, no light. I touch a face that is leather and horns and mine, mine, mine. They say, this man has flaxen hair, a mouth so fine the gods beg him to speak. They say my death will make him a hero. Everyone loves a hero. But a hero only loves you until he reaches the next island. This is my only island. To love is to unwind the long thread of your heart and at the end tie a noose. Love, come and get me. Earlier today I got to do a workshop with a great group of poets. I'll get to meet with them three more times, and we were talking about poems about animals. I was mentioning that uh, for much of my time in D.C., I lived within walking distance of the National Zoo, so the animals running throughout my poems are really not just metaphorical. They're quite literal. They're animals that I would smell and hear and sadly not get to pet, but <coughs> see on my daily walks. So this is a poem about the capybara. Uh, I think they're here in Ireland, not, not wild, but in the photo park. Uh, if you're not familiar with the capybara, it's the size of a guinea pig. Well, it looks like a guinea pig if a guinea pig was a size of a small dog. Um, if you've ever seen the Princess Bride, the rodents of unusual size would be like really grumpy capybara. Um, they're cute. I looked up every single detail about capybara that I could find. Unit of measure. All can be measured by the standard of the capybara. Everyone is lesser than or greater than the capybara. Everything is taller or shorter than the capybara. Everything is mistaken for a Brazilian dance craze more or less frequently than the capybara. Everyone eats greater or fewer watermelons than the capybara. Everyone eats more or less bark. Everyone barks more than or less than the capybara, who also whistles, clicks, 
grunts, and emits what is known as his alarm squeal. Everyone is more or less alarmed than a capybara, who because his back legs are longer than his front legs, feels as if he is going downhill at all times. Everyone is more or less a master of grasses than the capybara, or going by the scientific name more or less Hydrochorus hydrochirus, or going by the Greek translation more or less water hog. Everyone is more or less of a fish than the capybara, defined as the outermost realm of fishdom by the 16th century Catholic Church. Everyone is eaten more or less often for Lent than the capybara. Shredded, spiced, and served over plantains, everything tastes more or less like pork than the capybara before you decide that you are greater than or lesser than a capybara. Consider that while the Brazilian capybara breeds only once a year, the Venezuelan variety mates continuously. Consider the last time you mated continuously. <laughs> Consider the year of your childhood when you had exactly as many teeth as the capybara, 20, and all yours fell out and all his kept growing. Consider how his skin stretches in only one direction, except that you are stretchier than the capybara, except that you have foolishly distributed your eyes, ears, and nostrils all over your face except that now you will never be able to sleep underwater. Except that the fish will never gather to your capybara body, offering their soft, thin love, one of us, they say, one of us, but they will not say it to you. Count the Waves is uh, the most recent collection, and it, it moving from the self to outside the self, and then the self as an adult, the self as a, as a traveler, um, trying to play with ideas of how we know each other better or worse over long distances. I'm going to read uh, another animal poem, carrying over, but kind of a different way of looking at them. This is a poem about the peacock. Inventory. We gaze into your eyes, 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 eyes. We forget the display is blind. Your fan tail, really a cupped palm gathering each hen's quiver to your ear, your feathers, the green-blue glamours of reflective absence. No one ever praises the ass of the peacock, the grin of quills that does the heavy lifting, or how you eat anything from ants to styrofoam, from cheese to chicken. Road roamer, Flower devourer, the one who will pick a fight with a goat. Preen all you want. What I praise of you will be the bare undercarriage, the calamus. I am done with beauty. Only a blinking eye can measure the light. There's a form, uh, there's a couple of forms. I've been, I've been absolutely running my students ragged with the discussion of the sonnet over at UCC, and they've been very patient. Um, I love that form, but to be honest, the form that I work in most is the sestina. And there's six sestinas in this collection, which I think kind of reveal themselves to varying degrees, uh, depending on whether you're looking for it. But um, this sestina, which if you're not familiar, it's, it's a... It's a kind of acrobatic form because you commit to six end words in your first stanza, and they have to be repeated in a prescribed pattern. Uh, you'll hear an end word repeated at the end of one stanza, at the beginning of the next. So it's a kind of uh, sudoku or spiraling uh, game. And the premise for this is simply that uh, in 1772, when the first edition of Encyclopedia Britannica was, was published, one of the effects that it had was to 
aggregate and therefore kind of organize forms of knowledge so that folk knowledge was pushed to the margins. And you have, uh, in some ways, it continued to survive, but all these great regional understandings of what things were and how they came to be that way, that all of a sudden, for the first time, someone was officially saying, no, you can look it up in this book, and that's not true. And that's both a beautiful thing in some ways and a terrible thing in others. So the title of this is The Editor of Encyclopedia Britannica Regrets Everything. <laughs> with the uh, epigraph, Edinburgh, 1772. Add this to the list of truths they did not need, that the white fur that grows with no eyes, no tongue, is mere cotton. Scythian lamb, they had named it, believing the beast bent its umbilical stem to graze the fields before turning, bleeding, back to its flower pose. All God's creatures should have a flower pose. Did they need to know that that horn was not a horn, that no unihorse raced their fields? Instead, we gave them a crusty, cross-eyed sea whale who studies his own tooth, the bent bone spiral long enough to skewer a lamb. We made shish kebab out of magic. Lamb, forgive us. Maidens, forgive us. Your flowered wreaths gone to waste. Beloved truths bending to guillotine fat. What was is now not. They call it enlightenment, but my eyes see only shadows creeping down the fields, the mothers calling tots in from the fields, mothers now knowing all that hunts their lambs, how many teeth, legs, claws, how many eyes, each genus and species of deadly flower grown wild in Scotland. And no, we did not mean for our little book to take this bent any more than lightning means to take bent toward the farmhouse it sets aflame. The fields whipping orange into the night were not prophets or shepherds, not looking for lambs, were scientists. We thought truth was a flower waiting to be plucked by our hands and eyes. A body dissected is, to us, the body collected. We tore roots, bent stems, pressed petals in pages, called them flowers, measured topographies and called them fields, cut throat, shoulder, hawk, called it a lamb. What I'd give to see what lenses cannot see. I'd trade in my eyes to run these fields and bend my neck <coughs> meekly as a lamb to flowers tied by a sweet woman's knot. I'll just finish, speak my gratitude, I'm looking forward to hearing my fellow reader tonight, and I'll just finish with a little poem, a little love poem, for my husband, Champneys, who's here, who flew back over with me from the States just this past week. Ukulele. The vessel is simple, a rowboat among yachts. No one hides a Tommy gun in its case. No blues man runs over his uke in a whiskey rage. <laughs> the last of the Hawaiian queens translated the name gift that came here, while Portuguese historians translate jumping flea, the way a player's fingers pick and fly. If you have a cigar box, it'll do. If you have fishing line, it'll sing. If there is to be one instrument of love, not love vanished or imagined, but love, it's this one. Fit a melody in the crook of your arm and strum.
people. I come from people who swear without realising their swearing. I come from scaffolders and plasterers and shoemakers and carers. The type of carers paid pence per minute to visit an old lady's house. Some of my people have been inside a prison. Sometimes I tilt towards them and see myself reflected back. If they were from Yorkshire, which they're not, but if they were, they would have been the ones on the pickets shouting scab and throwing bricks at policemen. I come from a line of women who get married twice. I come from a line of women who bring up children and men who go to work. If I knew who my people were in the time before women were allowed to work, they were probably the women who were working anyway. If I knew who my people were before women got the vote, they would not have cared about the vote. There are many arguments among my people. Nobody likes everybody. In the time of slavery, my people would have had them if they were the type of people who could afford them, which they probably weren't. In the time of casual racism, some of my people would and will join in. Some of my people know everybody who lives on their street. They're the type of people who will argue with the teacher if their child has detention. The women of my people are wolves, and we talk to the moon in our sleep. Um, <clears throat> so I'm also very happy to be here. I've been to, I think this is my fifth time in Ireland now, um, and I always remember the first time I came um, for a, a festival on the plane on the way back to England, I sat and cried because I didn't want to leave. <laughs> I was on my own, so um, it was quite embarrassing, actually. <laughs> yeah, so um, after saying my people are the type of people who argue with the teacher if their child has detention, I then went and became a teacher, so I kind of saw it from the other side. Um, and I, I was a trumpet teacher for thir 13 years, so I travelled around schools in Cumbria, 25 schools a week, teaching them, um, teaching trumpet, trombone, baritone, cornet, tenor horn. Um, and then about seven years into the job, um, the government brought this new policy in called Wider Opportunities, which is where we had to go and teach a whole class of eight-year-olds how to teach, how to play the trumpet. They all got an instrument at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> what we did at our teacher training day when they said this is what you're going to be doing in a couple of weeks. Um, but actually I grew to really love it. It's a really disciplined way of, um, of learning to be a musician. It was like having my own army. Um, <laughs> so it fed into my inner dictator. Um, but I wrote this poem after that first trip to Ireland. I had, I had this amazing summer. I came to Ireland to do a festival and then I went to um, Croatia and I was just kind of living this glamorous life and then I had to go back to work in September um, and be covered in like spit from brass <laughs> instruments. <laughs> so this is called The Trumpet Teacher's Curse. And the, oh, the only other thing you need to know is the teacher was supposed to learn as well alongside the children. <laughs> and guess how well that went down. <clears throat> so The Trumpet Teacher's Curse. A curse on the children who tap the mouthpiece with the heel of their hand to make a popping sound. Who drop the trumpet on the floor, then laugh. A darker curse on those who fall with the trumpet in their hands and selfishly save themselves. A curse on the boy who dropped a pencil on the bell of his trombone to see if it did what I said it would. A curse on the girl who stuffed a pom-pom down her cornet and then said it was her invisible friend who did it. A curse on the class teacher who sits at the back of the room and does her paperwork. A curse on the teacher who says, I'm rubbish at music, in a loud enough voice for the whole class to hear. A curse on the father who coated his daughter's trumpet valves with Vaseline because he thought it was a thing to do. A curse on the boy who threw up in his baritone as if it was his own personal bucket. 
Let them be plagued with the urge to practice every day without improvement. Let them play in concerts each weekend which involve marching and outdoors and coldness. Let their family be forced to give up their Saturdays listening to bad music in village halls. Or spend their Sundays at the bandstand. Then, one dog and the drunk who slept there the night before, taking up the one and only bench. Gods, let it rain. <laughs> um, I always read my poems to my mum and dad who aren't into poetry at all. Um, not just to torture them. But <laughs> Um, and my mum said, well, that was just my life for 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was quite harsh. <laughs> Not like this poem. Um, so I've had, been having a bit of a weird experience the last two weeks. Um, last year I went on <coughs> this programme called Private Passions on Radio 4 which is like the posh version of Desert Island Discs. Mm. I explain it to my family. And then um, I made this stupid offhand comment, because my dad's a scaffolder, and I said, oh, um, I've, I've always wanted to be a poet in residence at a scaffolding company. <laughs> and the producer took me <coughs> my word and was like, that's an amazing idea, I'm going to pitch it to make a show about it. And I just said, oh, yeah, whatever, it won't, it won't happen. And I... I got an email and, it's, and she said it had been shortlisted, this, this show that she'd pitched. And I was like, all right, OK. And then I didn't hear anything for a year, so I thought, thank God, that's not happening. <laughs> um, and then I got another email two weeks ago and they said, it's going ahead. We're doing this, this programme about scaffolding and um, community, you know, because <laughs> they have to have an angle. So um, we uh, went to see my dad on his scaffolding sign and I spent the whole day there following him around and he... We sent him up the scaffold with a mic clipped to his <laughs> clipped to his jacket, um, and he loved it. Like you know, I, he, he turned into this kind of monster, <laughs> this media monster. And he was like ordering people around on the side and shouting. And I thought this is either going to go two ways. They're going to cut the whole thing, or they'll just dump me and just give my dad like a radio show. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I thought I would read a scaffold in Aaron. <laughs> So this is a psalm for the scaffolders. A psalm for the scaffolders who balanced like tightrope walkers, who could run up the bracing faster than you or I could climb a ladder, who wore red shorts and worked bare-chested, who cut their safety vests in half. A psalm for the scaffolders and their vans, their steel toe-capped boots, their coffee mugs. A psalm for those who learnt to put up a scaffold standing on just one board. A psalm for the scaffolder who could put a six-inch nail in a piece of wood with just his palm. A psalm for those who don't like rules or things taking too long. Who now mustn't go to work uncovered. Who mustn't cut their safety vests or climb without ladders. Who must use three boards at all times. A psalm for the scaffolders who fall with a harness on, who have ten minutes to be rescued. A psalm for the scaffolder who fell in a clear area, a tube giving way, that long, slow fall. A psalm for him, who fell thirty feet and survived. A psalm for the scaffolder who saw him fall. A psalm for those at the top of buildings, the wind whistling in their ears, the sky in their voices, for those who lift and carry and shout and swear, for those who can recite the lengths of boards and tubes like a song, a song for them, the ones who don't like heights but spent their whole life hiding it, a song for those who work too long, a song for my father, a song for him. <coughs> Um, so I'm just going to read um, two more poems from the book and then finish with some new, newer poems. Um, so in the middle of the book, there's a sequence called How I Abandoned My Body to His Keeping. Um, and the title poem of that sequence is a Sistina. Hurrah for the Sistina. Um, lots of people hate them, but I, I like them. Um, I might read the first poem and then the Sistina, actually, now I've banged on about it. Um, but the thing that made me want to re write a Sestina was um, I read a, a 
Kim Adenizio, who's coming to the soon, isn't she? Um, and she's uh, one of her books about writing, and she said the Sistina has to be about something that obsesses you. Um, and when I read that, it was like a kind of key clicking in my mind. Um, so I, I read the first poem, which isn't Sistina, and then the Sistina. <clears throat> and um, the sequence is about exploring, um, it's exploring an experience of domestic violence. In that year. And in that year, my body was a pillar of smoke. And even his hands could not hold me. And in that year, my mind was an empty table. And he laid his thoughts down like dishes of plenty. And in that year, my heart was the old monument, the folly, and no use could be found for it. And in that year, my tongue spoke the language of insects, and not even my father knew me. And in that year, I waited for the horses, but they only shifted their feet in the darkness. And in that year, I imagined a vain thing. I believed that the world would come for me. And in that year, I gave up on all the things I was promised and left myself to sadness. And then that year lay down like a path and I walked it, I walked it, I walk it. How I abandoned my body to his keeping. What happened sits in my heart like a stone. You told me I'd be writing about it all my life when I asked how to stop saying these things to the moon. I told you how writing it makes the dark lift and then settle again like a flock of birds. You said that thinking of the past like birds who circle each year will make the stone in my chest heavy that the dark that settles inside me will pass. You say it is over. You say that even the moon can't know all of what happened, that to ask to forget is to miss the point. I should ask to remember. I should open myself to the birds who sing for their lives. I should tell the moon how his skin was like smoke, his hand a stone that fell from a great height. It was not what I deserved. The year was dark because he was there and my eyes were dark and I fell to not speaking. If I asked him to leave, he would smile. Nothing in it was sacred and I didn't look up. The birds could have fallen from the sky like stones and I wouldn't have noticed. The moon was there that night in the snow. The moon was waiting the day the dark crept into my mouth and left me stone silent, stone dumb when all I could ask was for him to stop. Please stop. The birds fled to the trees and stayed there. It wasn't their fault. It was nobody's fault. It happened because I was still. The moon sung something he couldn't hear. The bird in my heart, silent for a year in the dark. This is the way it is now, asking for nothing but to forget his name a stone that I carry. It cools in my mouth in the dark and the moon sails on overhead. You ask about birds, but all I can talk of is stones. Um, so I'm just going to finish with some a few new poems. Um, so my next collection is, is, I'm still writing it after many years, um, and it's going to be called All the Men I Never Married. <laughs> um, I started off just writing one poem about an ex-boyfriend that had annoyed me, and then I thought I'd write one for all of them. <laughs> That's the kind of generous spirit that I am. <laughs> and then it kind of got out of control, because I thought I could write a poem, any poem with a man in it could be in All the Men I Never Married. Um, and I have had men in the audience... Like readings come up to me afterwards and say, oh, I want to be in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, be very careful what you wish for. Um, so this is a kind of new new poem that I'm imagining um, going at the beginning of the book. I've not read it before because I only kind of finished it last week. But um, 
the book is about, and I'm looking at um, writing about experiences of sexism, but also about female desire, and then sometimes the two kind of intersect, intersecting. So um, sometimes when you read poems about female desire, it um, invites sexism into the room, or probably more accurately uncovers the sexism that was already already there. So um, they're the kind of things that are going through through it. Um, and it's got this phrase about uh, the betweenness from this um, from Irigare, she who writes about the betweenness between people, betweenness. Um, I touch you awake. I touch you into your body. I touch you and bring you away from the world. I touch you with intention, knowing that touch is only a kind of surviving. I touch you as gesture, as act, as emotion. I touch you as question, as answer. I touch you as call, as difference, to avoid possession, to avoid ensnarement, fascination, submission. I touch you as gift, as word, in violence, as border, as limit, to say yes. I touch you to say no. I touch you as spell, as praise in the evening, to leave myself back to myself. I touch you with language, my best and brightest offer, as witness, with facts, with opinion. I touch you with sadness, mine, anger, mine. I touch you to persist. I touch you but cannot touch the betweenness between us. <coughs> um, I'm going to read a, a, a poem. Um, this is All the Men I Never Married, number 34. I told you I got a bit carried away. <laughs> um, and uh, I've got into trouble on Twitter today, if anyone does Twitter. Um, this poem was in the New Statesman, and it's um, annoyed a man. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry if there's any men in the room that get annoyed by this. I'll buy you a drink or something. I've got my free vouchers. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I've kind of given you a preconception of the poem now. I'll say that to you afterwards. But um, I have to warn you, it's apparently one step away from extremist ideology, this poem. <laughs> I find it quite exciting that a poem can irritate someone that much. Because <laughs> no, no, none of the poems in my first book irritated anybody. <laughs> I think this book's going to really irritate people. <laughs> um, anyway, so this is All the Men I Never Married, number 34. I let a man into my room because I couldn't bear the thought of him with someone else. Even though he wasn't, never had been, never would be mine. I showed a man into my room as if I was selling him the space. I opened the door and let a shadow follow me inside. I didn't turn on the light. I turned on every light. I allowed a man into my room and he was kind. I let a man push past me through the door and told myself I didn't really mind. I let a man follow me to my room and didn't close the door in time. I let a man into my room which turned into a lift and we were together then apart and together then apart depending on whether the door was open wide. I let a man into my body and let him sleep inside my room. I let him in, I let him in. I said that he could do these things but only in my mind. I let a man into my room and took a vow of silence, took a vow of there's no turning back because a mind is not for changing. The men inside my room do not like leaving. They think they know my name, but one of us is lying. I step across the threshold. I follow them inside. Once they're in, they're in. I open, then I close my eyes. Um, <clears throat> And I'm just going to finish with, um, with the, all the men I never married, number 40. <laughs> um, so often when I'm trying to write about experiences of sexism, um, I'm interested in the kind of, there's kind of more violent ones, but then the, the small, annoying experiences of sexism or the things that you wouldn't even tell someone about because they're, they're so commonplace that they're not, they would make a really boring story, which doesn't really sell the poem. 
Um, <laughs> but this idea of kind of nothing, nothingness at the heart of a lot of interactions of sexism. <clears throat> so this is all the men I never married, number 40, and thank you for, for listening. Imagine you're me, you're 15, the summer of 95, and you're following your sister onto the log flume, where you'll sit between the legs of a stranger. At the bottom of the drop when you've screamed and been splashed by the water, when you're about to stand up, clamber out, the man behind reaches forward and with the back of his knuckle brushes a drop of water from your thigh. To be touched like that for the first time, and you are not innocent, you're 15, something in you likes that you were chosen, it feels like power, though you are only the one who was touched, who was acted upon. To realise that someone can touch you without asking, without speaking, without knowing your name, without anybody seeing. You pretend that nothing has happened. You turn it to nothing. You learn that nothing is necessary armour you must carry with you. It was nothing. You must have imagined it. To be touched. And your parents waiting at the exit and smiling as you come out of the dark and the moment being hardly worth telling. What am I saying? You're 15 and he is a man. Imagine being him on that rare day of summer. The bulge of car keys makes it difficult to sit, so he gives them to a bored attendant who chucks them in a box marked property. A girl balanced in the boat with hair to her waist and he's close enough to smell the cream lifting in waves from her skin, her legs stretched out. And why should he tell himself no, hold himself back? He reaches forward, brushes your thigh with a knuckle, then gets up to go, rocking the boat as he leaves. You don't remember his face or his clothes, just the drop of water, perfectly formed on your thigh, before it's lifted up and away by his finger. You remember this lesson your whole life, that sliver, shiver of time, that moment in the sun. What am I saying? Nothing. Nothing happened. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's so funny you say that about Berwin because, I mean, for the last years of his life, he lived in Kauai, and he wrote a beautiful book length poem about the indigenous peoples of Kauai and, and what uh, this is in Hawaii, uh, in the American islands. And the funny thing was, was that he actually invited people into his space so that they could see the trees, the, the trees and the native plants that he had cultivated on the land. So isn't that funny that I would have not ever thought of him as a, I think he was protective of his space unless it was in the circumstances in which he wants to share it. And I feel the same way about social media, like you keep your garden, you know, and I think that I, I, I the thing that I've learned is never go online just to say, I'm, I'm so sorry I haven't been around, or I'm about to go away. No one notices. No one notices. And, and I think that once you start doing that kind of performative social media, whether it be signal boosting for causes that you want to put your mouth service to but not your actions, or uh, or getting involved in the kind of little wars, then you're... You're not tending your roots, Merwin would say. You're letting you're letting the invading species take over <laughs> the land. So I, I think it's I think you just have to find the balance. Yeah, I think um, uh, with social social media um, uh, and the kind of Twitter thing, to me, part of me finds it really funny, and and I know that I'll probably write about it. So I kind of. But part of me finds it scary because I think I could get lots of kind of trolling because I've had an opinion and I'm on Twitter. Um, but part of me finds it funny and I'll probably write a poem about, he'll probably be in all the men I never married, number 41, and that'll serve him right. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'm doing a PhD about this kind of sexism thing, so I know that I'll write it up into the academic writing. So when it, when it's... If I can use it like that, then I think it's it's okay. But I've only actually, I'll only waste so much energy on it. I think that's the 
a, a lesson I've learned that if I'm using too much energy on messing about on Twitter and social media then, and I'm not writing, then it, kind of, it kind of becomes pointless. Well, I, I know that in my poems that I read tonight, you could hear the returns to Animalia, to, to mythology. Uh, those are, I, I joke that I was the jukebox could have also been called Mounds and Fire. Because I did an edit at the manuscript stage where I realized far too many of these poems either end in a mouth or a fire or a fiery mouth or a mouth of fire. Uh, you know, so we, we have to we have to kind of both honor our motifs and then apply pressure to them. Right now, the, the poems that I'm working on now are very much about uh, they're kind of dealing with the American politic, uh, among other things, looking at um, food traditions. I, I edited a, a book called Vinegar and Char, verse from the Southern Foodways Alliance, and I was thinking a lot about how food traditions feed into our sense of culture. Um, and also memorials and monuments, what gets added to the official story and what gets left out. Cork has been a great place to be, to be thinking about those, uh, those tensions, those decisions. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm probably, you probably heard what I'm obsessed with because I'm in the mid, coming to the end of this this book that I'm working on. So sexism, female desire, um, the kind of female gaze, and what happens when you put kind of masculinity or men look, look at men. But also coming back to this idea of discomfort, because I find a lot of the poems uncomfortable to write and to read as well. You know, like the, the last one to say. The last one that I read about the, the guy on the on the, the water in the water park, um, to kind of write about complicity but without blame victim blaming, I think is really difficult. And I'm interested in that kind of border where things aren't black and white. Um and and I guess to go back to the last question, I think part of being a poet for me is being a kind of activist as well and speaking about things. Um that are that leave you uncomfortable you know it's not i'm making a joke out of it but it's not i don't find it easy but i feel like i can't keep my mouth shut sometimes um yeah so that's that's my kind of obsessions i nearly said i'm obsessed with writing about men and that sounds really bad um, it's not that simple is your, is your phd creative or critical yeah it's a creative critical so part of it will be my second collection and then 20 to forty thousand words of critical stuff <laughs> <laughs> that I'm really on with as well. I'm so on it. Please give a round of applause and the books are